favorite song. So, so hey, they learn how to sing. I was going to break out and sing. <laughs> and, uh, they got to the movie now, but yes, let's stand together, show, and we turn uh, in our hymnals to number 97, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Number 97, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Oh, hear the power of Jesus, make their angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Stand to two. God and our Father, that is the cry of our heart, to join the everlasting song yes, Lord. and crown you Lord of all. Yes. For you and you alone are worthy to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Father, until that day, we pray that you will indeed order our footsteps please, please. in your word, that you would lead us and guide us after thy own way. And now, Father, bless us as we come to this time that is set aside for your word to be heralded. Yes, you anoint this, your servant, and you saturate his mind with your spirit and with your truth. We energize and we preach as a vessel, meet for the master's use. Prepare the these the hearts and the minds of your weighty people to receive with meekness your engrafted word that's able to save their souls. May they be strengthened. May their burden be lifted. May their countenance be brightened. May their shoulders be straightened. May they look to the hills which come their help. Yes. May they leave this place today saying, God lives, he lives inside of me. Yes. So I don't feel yes. in no ways tired. All right. and Father, speak to that one who's maybe never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. May they sense their great need to know the Savior today. And may they yield and cry, what must I do to be saved? Will you save them by your grace, yes. your loving kindness, and your mercy? Claim that backslider, Father, to yourself. Restore that indifferent person for the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
you have your Bibles handy, I invite your attention to the New Testament book of Colossians. Okay. Colossians chapter 1. Mm-hmm. This is about our sixth message, or fifth message, I believe, in the book of Colossians. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are having a great journey in this marvelous little epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Mm-hmm. They're in Asia Minor, about 100 miles east of Ephesus, near Heropolis and Laodicea. And though the book was written over 1900 years ago, it still speaks to us yeah. with perennial freshness. Colossians chapter 1. Mm-hmm. And I would like to call your attention this morning to verses 24 through 29. Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, mm-hmm. and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, mm-hmm. that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generation, but has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we might present every man complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. I want to speak this morning from the subject of servants of the gospel. Servants of the gospel. There's a story about a man and his young daughter, and they lived in the country. And they were walking down the road one day, and the young girl saw this donkey. And the donkey had a long face, and he was neighing and making a lot of noise. He had sat down in the middle of the road, refusing to pull his master's cart making all kind of fuss. And the young girl looked at her daddy and she said, Daddy, that donkey would make a good Christian. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Having been to the church herself and saw so many long-faced Christians neighing and making a lot of noise, sitting down in the middle of the gospel path, she said, donkey would make a good Christian. <laughs> That we allow such Christians here. But unfortunately, far too few of us are experiencing the joy of serving God. The joy of Christian service. The joy of uh, disengaging and discharging our spiritual gift in the context of a local church. And the sense of euphoria that comes along with seeing God move and touch, change people's lives. Seeing God save souls and reclaim backsliders. That's why I wish you could have been here this past Wednesday night. As some of the people who stood and testified who've gone through great trial and great tests and great tribulation, and some who've experienced great heartache and setback still stood and testified that God is good all the time he's good. And they blessed the Lord by the word of their testimony. The Apostle Paul was such a man who could find the silver lining in the darkest of clouds. Because Paul believed that his ministry was directly linked to the work of Christ. He believed that his ministry was directly linked to the work of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ was continuing his life in and through the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Now we must believe that, my beloved friends, that Jesus Christ continues his life in and through us. Salvation was complete. On the cross of Calvary, when Jesus was pinned to that cross, he shed his blood. He was buried and raised from the dead. But he told his disciples, 
that they would receive power after the Holy Ghost had come upon them, and they would be witnesses unto him both in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and even in the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Jesus sent back the Holy Spirit to reside in all of his believers that he might continue his work in his life, that he might continue his ministry. We become his eyes, his hands, his feet, his legs. We are the body of Christ. We are the continuation of his life. And that should give us a great sense of excitement and a great sense of joy. In this epistle to the church at Colossae, Paul was writing them to protect them against false doctrine, against false teaching. They had been established by a man by the name of Epaphras, who had been converted when Paul was ministering at Ephesus. Epaphras had went back home to Colossae, preached the gospel, people got saved. He was now discipling them in the word of God. He was ruling them in the faith. And he had taught them that Jesus Christ was God manifest in human flesh, and all the fullness of God resided in Christ, and they were complete in Christ. And everything they needed to live the Christian life they had in the person of Jesus Christ. With these false doctrines that were floating around in the air there in Asia Minor. And one such teaching, it denied the deity of Christ. Say that Christ was merely nothing more than an emanation of God. He was maybe an angel at best in God's spiritual hierarchy. And that salvation was not based on faith in Christ, but it was going through this angelic hierarchy, hoping that one day maybe you would get to God. These false teachers denied the physical body of Christ, denied his physical crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. Rather than trying to refute all of the erroneous teachings of the false teachers line by line, Paul just wrote to the church at Colossae to undergird them in the truth. You see, you cannot study all the false doctrines that's out there. You cannot become a master of all the cultic teachings that exist. But our calling is to master the truth, to know in whom we have believed, to know what we believe, and when we know what we believe, and we understand the truth of the word of God, then we will be able to sift out the false teachings and the false doctrine. And so Paul writes to the church at Colossae, and he lifts up and he elevates Jesus Christ. He exalts him. Verse 13 of Colossians 1, he says, For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. We have redemption in him. He has purchased us from the slave market. We have forgiveness in him. He has canceled our sin debt. He went on to say he is the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of God, the exact replica of God. He went on to say he is the creator of all things, verse 16, for by him all things were created both in heavens and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. So he exalts Jesus Christ as being the preeminent one. He is preeminent because of his relationship with God. He is God manifest in human form. No man has seen God at any time, John writes in John 1.18, but the only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In the fullness of time, God brought forth his Son. Amen. Amen. So because of his relationship with God, Jesus Christ is preeminent. Because of his relationship with creation, he is the creator. He is the agent of creation. He is the purpose for creation. And to borrow from the Greek philosophers who believed there had to be a primary cause, and there had to be a, a secondary cause, and a final cause. He says he's the primary cause, the secondary cause, and the final cause. He created everything. He created everything for himself, and it's by his own power that he created everything. Right. He is preeminent, this Jesus of Nazareth. And then Paul went on to say, verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church. He is beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might have to come, might have first place in everything. He is preeminent. He should have first place because of his relationship to God, because of his relationship to creation, because of his relationship to the church. He's first. And then Paul says in verse 19, for it was a father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. 
Then he describes the Colossian state before they came to Christ. They were alienated from God, hostile in their mind, engaged in evil deeds. Yet God was in Christ reconciling them back to himself. And then in verse 24, he sort of changed and turns the curve a bit because in these first 23 verses, he said nothing about himself other than he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Verse 1. Paul, knowing that it's important that he establish himself, his apostolic credentials, because his enemies, those false teachers, would try to undermine his integrity, to undermine the veracity of his office. For if you can discredit the messenger, you can discredit the message. And so Paul thought it important for him to say something about his own ministry so that the Colossians would know that he was not some self-styled apostle. But he had the authority by direct divine revelation for God. He was God's mouthpiece. He had the authority to speak on God's behalf. Mm -hmm. Now look at what he says, verse 24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Now back up to 23. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Paul says that he was a minister. And the first point I want you to see here, in describing his own ministry, Paul describes himself as a servant or a minister of the gospel. A servant or a minister of the gospel. The word there, minister in the Greek, diakonos, from which we get our word deacon, and it's translated servant. Paul saw himself as a diakonos of the gospel, as a servant of the gospel. And as a servant of the gospel, Paul then saw his own life to be nothing more than a venue for the gospel to be put on display. And that's why he'd write to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10. He would say, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Even something as mundane as eating and drinking, Paul says, whatever you do, it all to the glory of God. Why, Paul? Because you are a diakonos, you are a servant of the gospel. You are a minister of the gospel. In your life, 24-7, 365 days of the year, 366 days of the leap year, are to be on display so the gospel might be saved. Right. He saw himself as a servant of the gospel. That's why Peter would write in 1 Peter 3.15, he would say, but sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give men a reason for the hope that you have with meekness and in fear. Peter says we should live our lives in such reverential fear of God, realizing that we are servants of the gospel, that we're always ready to give people a reason for the hope that we have. And the reason that we have hope is that we know that we have been reconciled to God through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are servants of the gospel. Now far too many in Christendom think that the gospel is their servant. Thus we end up with a health, wealth gospel, a prosperity gospel, where people believe that by embracing the gospel, they can use it as an Aladdin's lamp and can rub it and get three or even more than that wishes for themselves. The gospel is not given to you to serve you. God saves you and I so that we can become a servant, a diakonos of the gospel. Paul went on to say about being a servant of the gospel, point A under point one, I'm a servant of the gospel by sovereign call. It was not his choice. Paul did not choose to be a servant of the gospel. God in Christ chose him. Now you remember the conversion of the apostle Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we have the record of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul was trained as a Hebrew. In Philippians 3, he says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrew. As touching the law, zealous, righteous according to the law. Educated at the feet of the preeminent 
Hebrew theologian of the day, a man by the name of Gamaliel. Paul was born into a very, very affluent family. Father gave him the best of education. He was educated by Gamaliel. He was a Roman citizen. He could speak several languages. He was a brilliant man. And he believed that Jesus Christ was an antichrist. And so Paul had committed his life to trying to extinguish the light of Christ. And so he went from place to place, getting arrest warrants, to go off and arrest Christians. And he was on to Damascus, on his way to Damascus, and he had warrants in his saddlebag for the arrest of Christians. He might bring them back to Jerusalem. They might be tried and beaten and even some executed. But on that Damascus road, the Bible says that a great light shone unto Paul. And the light was so brilliant that it eclipsed the rays of the sun. And Paul was knocked to the desert sands. And then a voice from heaven in the Hebrew tongue spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul responded by saying, who am I, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Rise, go into the city, and I will show you what things that will happen to you. So Paul was a servant of the gospel by sovereign call. In Acts chapter 26, however, is one of my favorite passages where Paul himself is recounting his conversion. And he's recounting his conversion in the presence of King Agrippa. And in verse 13 of Acts 26, Paul is speaking. He says, verse 12, While thus engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Let's stop right there. We don't have a clue what a goad is. In the cultural context, what they would do is that they would have an ox. If they were trying to get this ox to move something or to do some work, very often the oxes would become stubborn and they would stall. And they would put behind the ox an instrument that had points on the end of it. And that was called the gold. And so when the ox would kick back, he would hit that gold and it would pierce his flesh. And that would serve as motivation to him to move forward. So what Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, it's hard for you to kick against the goals. Think that you can kick against God and win. It's just like trying to kick against a piece of wood with nails in it. You're only afflicting pain on yourself because your arms are too short to box with God. So he says to him, it's hard on you, not on me, by you kicking against my will. Verse 15 and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And note, Jesus Christ identifies himself. He is so inextricably woven and related to the church, so that anything that a person does to the church, Jesus takes it personally. Any criticism that is leveled against the church, Jesus takes that criticism personally. Any persecution against the church, Jesus takes that persecution literally. Why? Because Jesus indwells his church. And the church of the body of Christ, the continuation of the life, life of Christ. So anything you do against the church, you do against Jesus. Anything you do for the church, you do it for Jesus. And so you never can lose by giving of your time, treasure, and talent to the local church. Because when you give, you are given to Jesus. And Jesus Christ will never be indebted to anybody. He will never owe anyone. So he says to Saul, you're persecuting me. But arise and stand on your feet for this purpose I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people, from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. So you note there in that text, in verse 16, he says, I am appointing you a minister and a witness. 
Paul was a servant of the gospel by so sovereign call. Jesus Christ called him. Jesus Christ appointed him to be a minister of the gospel. And I just thought about it to tell you, he also called you. When he calls you to salvation, it is not just so that you can attend sanctified pep rallies and feel real good when the choir sings. He calls you, he sets you apart, he appoints you to be diakonos, to be ministers of the gospel. And to be a servant of the gospel with a spirit of joy. You know there in Colossians 1, 24, he says, now I rejoice. And so Paul said he rejoiced in serving the Lord and being a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 through 17, you don't have to turn, but let me read it, write the record down. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17, Paul says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. Now let me interpret this thing. Paul said, don't pat me on the back, don't give me accolades because I'm preaching the gospel. He says, because I'm not preaching this of my own choice. I'm preaching it because I was sovereignly called and appointed by God to preach. It's not a voluntary thing. He is an irresistible thing. He said, it's against my own will. I was called by God and entrusted with this stewardship. He says, woe is unto me if I don't preach. Amen. Judgment is upon me if I don't preach. It's like Jeremiah said, it's like fire that is shut up in my bones. It is an, an irresistible call. It is an irresistible passion. I'm under compulsion, he says, to preach. It's a sovereign. It's a sovereign appointment. But I believe that sovereign call and that sovereign appointment is not only for those who are called to a pulpit ministry. I believe that every Christian is called and appointed by God to Christian ministry and service. Amen. And the reason so many of us are so frustrated and we can't find meaning and purpose in life is that we never set our face like a flint to try to figure out why did God give me life and why did God save me in the first place. You must find your sovereign call. And once you find that sovereign call, you settle into that sovereign call and you serve the Lord with a spirit of joy. Realizing that it is a high calling and a grand privilege that God would save you out of sin and not only save you out of sin, but then appoint you to service. And the Apostle Paul never got over the awe of it all. First of all, that he was saved in the first place. And secondly, that God would set him apart to preach. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, this is what Paul says to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, verse 11. He says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Yes. Paul says, I thank the Lord that he saved me and called me and put me into service. Not that I was qualified. God does not equip the qualified. God equips the called. And he qualifies the ones he called. In verse 13, he says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, the King James said, injurious person, I like that. And yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy state and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost. Right. Paul said, I was a chief sinner. And he says, I became an example of what God can do. God can save sinners and sanctify them. Sovereignly called and appoint them and set them apart for his service and use sinners like myself, Paul says, to reach other people for Christ. Are you a servant of the gospel? Are you a minister of the gospel, the sovereign call? Serving with a spirit of joy and realizing it's a grand privilege. It's a high call to be in the service of the Lord. Not only Paul see himself as a servant 
of the gospel. But he saw himself as one, a servant, who suffered and sacrificed to serve. A servant who suffered and sacrificed to serve. Look at what else he says there in Colossians of chapter 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Paul says, I'm serving, I'm sacrificing to serve, because I'm serving the body of Christ, I'm serving the saints of God, I'm serving the church, and I also realize I'm serving Jesus in so doing. Mm -hmm. Then with the right of Hebrews said in Hebrews 12, 1, he says that since we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, All right. and the reference he was making was to those who have lived the Christian life before us. Yeah. He says, we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us run with patience. And the word in, uh, patience, the hupopone, it means endurance, to bear up under a heavy load. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Yeah. And there's a race that is set before every single Christian. There's a track that's set before us. You can't run on my track, and I can't run on your track. There's a race, there's a track that is set before each and every one of us. But the writer of Hebrews says, we're to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, for consider him, lest you grow weary and faint in your mind. When you get tired and when you get weary and when you want to quit, consider Jesus. Consider the race that was set before him and consider how he ran the race the Father set before him all the way to Golgotha, to Calvary's Mount, to lay down his life as a sacrifice for our sins. He might take it up again. He says, consider him. But as you're running, you can run with joy, knowing that after wine, by and by, God is going to make it all right. So Paul says, I serve and I sacrifice for the saints and for the church for the body of Christ. The early believers, they consider it a privilege to sacrifice for Christ. If you look in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the religious leaders had warned the apostles not to preach in Jesus' name. Not to preach. They preached the gospel anyway. And then they were ushered back to the religious leaders and they were beaten and rebuked and warned to not preach. And the Bible says they went away shouting and praising God that they was worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Are you a servant that suffers and that sacrifices for the body of Christ, for the church, for the saints? Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians 1.29, he says, For it is given unto you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. He went on to write to the church at Philippi in Philippians 2.17. He said, that, and if I be offered on the sacrifice and the service of your faith, he says, if I am being poured out for you, I rejoice yeah. in the privilege of being poured out on the benefit of the people of God. And my beloved, suffering has its redeeming value. Yeah, for when we suffer, we're drawn closer to Christ when we're suffering for his cause. And that's why Paul in Philippians 3.10 would say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. When we suffer for Christ, it gives us the assurance of knowing that we really belong to him. When 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says, Yea, and all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, he says, If you suffer, don't suffer as a busybody. Don't suffer as a gossiper. Don't suffer as a thief. But if you suffer, suffer as a Christian. Suffer because you're trying to live right and live for God. And be a testimony for the Lord in the midst of a dark and a corrupt and perverse nation and world. So it brings us closer to him. It gives us the assurance that we belong to him. And suffering for Christ brings the promise of future reward. For I heard Paul in Romans 8.18. He says, for I reckon. I like that word. My grandma used to say that word. Boy, I reckon. I reckon that the suffering of this present time, Paul said, is not worthy to be, to be compared to the glory 
will shall be revealed in us. And in the second Corinthians 4, Paul talks about being beaten and being stoned and shipwrecked and left for dead. And Paul said, that's nothing but light affliction. When I compare it to the eternal weight of glory, which shall be revealed in me in the day of the Lord. So he saw himself as a servant of the gospel, a servant that suffered and sacrificed for the sake of the church, the body of Christ. In 2 Timothy 2.10, Paul says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. See, the apostle Paul believed that there are people that God had called to be saved. And all he had to do was to preach the gospel to every creature that he encountered. Mm -hmm. And that in so doing, that God, the Holy Spirit, would call people to salvation through the proclamation of the gospel. Are you so committed to sharing your faith and to living out your faith that you realize that there are people that you're encountering every single day and some of those people God has appointed to salvation and you are yielding yourself as an instrument to allow the Holy Spirit to use your life as a venue to put the gospel on display that people might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 20, Paul wrote to the church, or he spoke to the, the Ephesian elders. Before he left, he called them to a little island at Miletus, and he told the Ephesian elders, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, unto the, all the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit had made you overseer, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. The commitment that Paul had to the saints, to the church, he's willing to suffer for them, that they may grow in the faith. Not only did Paul see himself as a servant of the gospel, by sovereign call and appointment, serving with joy, and not only did he see him except for this servant who suffered and sacrificed for the saints. But Paul saw himself as a servant with a stewardship. Now walk with me, children, I won't be long. He saw himself as a servant with a stewardship. And he was a steward of the mysteries of God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, Paul says, it is... It is required of a steward that one first be found faithful. So use that word steward there also. In Colossians, if you have the King James translation of the scripture, it probably in verse 25 says dispensation. That word dispensation is the same word that is translated stewardship. It's derived from the same Greek word oikonomia, oikos, which means house. Nemos, which means law or to manage. So the oiko Nemos was the house manager, the one who had the law who ruled in the house. And so the steward did not own the house or the possessions in the house. The steward was a hired servant. He was delegated the responsibility of managing the household by his master so that his master could give himself to other affairs. Paul saw himself as a steward, a house manager, that God had delegated to him, had relegated to him the responsibility for managing certain things in the kingdom of God. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul told Timothy, he says, I've written these things unto you that you might know how to behave yourself in the household of God. So Paul saw the church not only as the body of Christ, but he also saw it as a household that needed to be managed. Right. And that's what he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 when he gave him the qualifications for the bishops and the elders, the deacons and the overseers. He says, if a man doesn't know how to rule to manage his own house, how can he take care of the house of God? Right. So the church is a household that needs to be managed. Right. It's a household that needs to be led. Right. It's a household where there are chores and duties and responsibilities that must be carried out and executed. If not, we will end up with a mess. Amen. And all of us are given responsibilities in the household. Yes. All of us have been delegated duties, chores, responsibilities that we are to execute and to carry out. And that when Jesus Christ returns, he's wanting to know how faithful have we been at discharging and exercising our stewardship. Paul says something interesting here. Mm -hmm. He says that I'm a steward 
of the mysteria, the mysteries. And in the scripture, Paul often refers to mysteries. He talks about the mystery of the church in Ephesians. He talks about the mystery of godliness in, in Timothy. He talks about the mystery of iniquity in Thessalonians. And now he talks about the mystery as referred to the Gentiles. All right, but look at what he says. That's that's that part of my stewardship is to proclaim the mystery of God. All right. Verse 27 or 25, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed upon me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generation, but has now been manifest to his saints. All right. God had a secret in the Old Testament. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, God had a lot of sacred secrets in the Old Testament. Yeah. And that's why the writer of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 29, he would say the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things which are revealed belong to us. God didn't tell no one some of his secrets. And one of the secrets he had was a secret concerning the Gentiles not only being grafted into the body and the Gentile and the Jew comprising one body of Christ, but there was another sacred secret, another hidden mystery, and it was Christ in us. That God in the person of Christ, in the person of the Holy Spirit, would reside in each and every one of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the mystery he's referred to in here. The mystery of the indwelling spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not cause us to do crazy things that doesn't make sense. He calls us to do things that make sense. Because God is not the author of confusion. And so where the spirit of the Lord is reigning, there is order and there is structure. And things make sense. And so Paul says... That this hope that you now have within you, the indwelling Christ. And so we proclaim him. The false teachers, they proclaim philosophies and wisdom and isms. But Paul says, we preach a person. And the person we preach is Christ. To the Greeks, it sounds like foolishness. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. But we preach Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Christ, the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God. Christ, the salvation of God. Right. And so he says, we proclaim this person of Christ. And how do you proclaim him, Paul? Well, we proclaim him in this way. Verse 27. To whom God will to make known what is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. The word that Paul uses there for admonish, it carries the idea of counsel. Counsel in view of sin and punishment. And Paul says, so we admonish everyone, we warn everyone, we rebuke everyone in the light that if they continue in sin, they can expect the chastisement of God if they are a believer. They can expect the judgment of God if they are not a believer. We admonish everyone. And that's why in Colossians 3.16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. That's why in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, all scriptures give my inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, the woman of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished, complete, mature, ready to do all good works. Amen. So he says we admonish, but not only that, we teach, we instruct, we teach by precept, we teach by practice, we teach by example. He says, we teach. And that's why we must maintain an unwavering commitment to clear biblical exposition. Yes, yes. Not spiritual theatrics. Right. Not spiritual aerobics. But biblical exposition because we got to admonish and we got to teach. And people cannot learn if they're not being taught in a systematic way 
that makes good use of the language that they are familiar with, that they might understand those deep, hidden things of God. And Paul went on to say, we're steward of this mystery. We proclaim the person of Christ for the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the believers. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, write it down, read it, memorize it. Paul talks about the reason that God gave gifted people to the church. For he gave some evangelists and some apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors for the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints, for the building up of the body of believers unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the believers can do the work of the ministry. So we preach him, we proclaim him to perfect the saints, and we do it in the power of his might. Verse 28, and we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. And for this purpose also, I labor, striving according to the power that mightily works within. Paul says, as a steward of this mystery, he proclaimed Christ for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints by the power of the indwelling Christ. That's the power that propels. But he used some interesting words there. He says, I labor. And the word that Paul used for labor encouraged the idea of working to the point of exhaustion. He says, I strive. The word strive, that we get our word agonize. He says, I labor. I work to the point of exhaustion. I strive. I agonize until Christ is formed in you, the believers. Well, as I close, <coughs> I'm going to ask you a question. Are you a servant of the gospel? Do you recognize the sovereign call and appointment? Do you serve with a sense of joy? Or are you like that donkey in the middle of the road? Kicking and clawing and neighing and doing everything what God has called you to do. Do you find at times that you're serving and sacrificing and suffering for the saints, for the church, the body of believers? Have you come to the realization that you are a steward? You are a house manager that God has entrusted to you the sacred secrets of the scripture, that God has given to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he has equipped you and gifted you with spiritual gifts that you might serve him effectively. And the way you serve him is by seeking to reach people who are lost and by trying to build up those who are saved. I know sometimes people look at some of you and say, y'all crazy. Fools and knuckleheads. Some of you who teach Sunday school. My Sunday school teachers, they prepare and, and they come and they're ready to teach. And they labeled over the text and they've done diligent to show themselves approved as workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And some of my beloved students I not committed enough to show up to be taught. So they can't learn and they can't grow. And some will say, well, you, you're foolish for preparing. No, no. The foolish one is the one who's going to show up. But one who has prepared has already saturated his soul or her soul and in so doing has strengthened their own soul against the tide of evil, against the onslaught of wickedness that will come our way. And some think that Brother Ben Tolliver and Tom and Brother Ed Hill, they're foolish to go out there trying to preach the gospel to those people who are incarcerated. They can't do any better. They aren't going to do any better. They violate the law. They deserve to be punished. Amen. But even behind prison walls there are souls that God has elected unto salvation. Amen. And one is no fool to respond to a sovereign call to be compelled to have an irresistible passion to share Christ to anyone that will listen. And if you have to incarcerate them to get a captive audience, then let it so be. Amen. But who knows whom God might choose to save? Amen. Out of that rag tag bunch. Amen. 
And some of you will think that those who labor and work and trying to help the kids out in the neighborhood, they're wasting their time, a bunch of thugs, a bunch of knuckleheads, drug dealers, don't push it. They're not going to ever amount to anything. But who knows what God might do? And who God might saw it say, and God might call. Paul was one who had consented to the murder of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Had walked in his pocket going to Damascus to have men and women arrested and hold off the prison. But God arrested him. Amen. And who can tell who God might use you to reach with the unsearchable riches of Christ? Amen. If you allow this gospel to propel you and to energize you, if you allow this gospel to take the reins of your life, if you realize that you are a servant of the gospel, it doesn't serve you. All right. And where he says, no, you go. And what he says, do, you do. And you ought to labor at it sometime. Amen. There are times you ought to be agonized in prayer over people who are lost, dead in trespasses and sin. And so to pick up the telephone call and call them folk and tell them how bad somebody is, why don't you go and then your prayer call and, and have a little talk with Jesus and agonize in prayer. And labor to the point of exhaustion that somebody might be saved. Amen. I hear what Jesus said. He went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and there he was transfigured there, and there in all of his majesty and glory, it shined through his countenance. In the meantime, his disciples were at the foot of the mountain. Yeah. A man came to them who had a young man who was demon-possessed, yeah. and they had watched Jesus do it. All right. And Jesus did it with such finesse and with such grace and such savoir faire. So they said, ministry is easy. And so they thought they'd just say, come out of him, maybe. And they spoke to the demon, and the demon <laughs> paid him no attention. And they tried it again, and the demon paid him no attention. Jesus came back off the mountain, and the man brought the young man to Jesus, and Jesus cast the demon out of him. And they looked at him and said, Lord, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we do what you just did? They didn't understand that Jesus had been on the mountain in the presence of his father. Amen. There in the presence of his father, he was anointed and he was energized. And there he was in fasting and prayer. And Jesus says, these can come out except by prayer and fasting, fasting and prayer. Amen. And there's some things that we're dealing with in our own homes. It's the work of the devil. Amen. And we think we can blow the dust off the Bible every now and then and read a few verses and he's going to flip. We want to. you got to pray, children. Amen. you got to agonize in prayer. you got to be serious about serving God. Amen. you got to ca cast caution to the wind and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Amen. At whatever cost. Yeah, that's right. At whatever cost. Yeah. Because in the end, you really don't have no choice. Amen. In the end, you really don't have any choice. Because when he calls you, it's sorry. Yep. There's no turning back. Amen. What the songwriter said, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. I've told you this story before, but it bears repeating. My brother-in-law, whom I love dearly, and I remember when he and my sister got married, August the 2nd, 1980, and they had this grand plan she would go out to Champagne and continue education, and he would stay here and work and support her. And after about two weeks, that got old. And he called and said, look, you need to come help me move. He's been a musician all of his life, ever since he was about 14, all of his life savings, was tied up in all of his equipment and so forth. He filed bankruptcy, liquidated everything he had. And all he had left was a little Honda Civic had about 200,000 miles on it. It didn't even have a reverse. And I remember his, him calling myself and his father, the late Jonathan Davis, and we helped him pack up the little Civic, and Mr. Davis was trying to talk him out of it. He said, son, you, you, you're traveling five or 600 miles. This car got over 200,000 miles on it. It's spitting oil. It's, it's misfiring. It won't run right. And on top of that, it don't have a reverse. <laughs> to which my beloved brother-in-law looked at Daddy square in the eye. He said, Daddy, I ain't backing up. <laughs> he said, I'm going to Champagne. Everything that I love that's near and dear to me is in Champagne. Amen. 
I have no intention of putting it in reverse. Jesus. I'm not turning back. Amen. I'm not coming back. I'm casting caution to the wind. All right. When you follow Jesus, Amen. you get rid of the reverse. That's right. As a matter of fact, you don't even need a rearview mirror. That's right. For everything to be the significance and importance up ahead. That's right. Now what Paul says, right. getting those things which are behind me, reaching forth to that which is before me, I press toward the mark for the prize. For the upward call Amen. of God Amen. in Christ. Amen. Let's bow together, shall we? Amen. Uh. Father, we thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul, yeah. a servant of the gospel, by sovereign call and appointment, and served with the spirit of joy, Amen. served and sacrificed suffered for the saints, for the church, for Christ. A servant who saw himself as a steward of the mysteries of God. So he proclaimed the person of Christ to perfect the saints. And he did it by the power of the indwelling spirit. And that same spirit that propelled and powered the apostle Paul that same Holy Spirit is resident inside of each and every one of us in the name of the name of Christ. And we thank you for that. That same Spirit still touches men and women, boys and girls who are not saved and invite them to come to Jesus to have their sins forgiven, to receive eternal life. That same Spirit bids backsliders to come repent. That same spirit bids believers to unite with local fellowships that they might labor and strive for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Father, you are the sovereign one. Call whom you will in Jesus' name. Since God called him, you'll come. Don't respond to my call. I don't have a heaven to take you to.